Hey guys, I'm Torre from MSNBC. What an extraordinary film that we just watched. Uh, this is Jess, Valerie, the uh, director. Okay. And John, the executive producer. And I, was, I was watching it last night at home. My wife was out, and I was hoping that she did not come in to, to tell her the story because she would be horrified as a mother. And then uh, and she came in after it was over, and then this morning I told her about it, and she was horrified as a mother by this whole story. It is so captivating and painful and tragic, and yet the film is beautiful and engrossing. Um, what drew you to the story? You know, I, th I think um, I was telling John this earlier. When I first heard about the story, it was I was in Rome, and it was Andrew Salmon, the British journalist, was like doing this English language news piece, and it just kind of stuck in my head, partially like the dramatic way that he tells the story. And then, as you know, the trial unfolded and the ruling happened, it just seemed like a very poignant moment in our like journey as humans when we kind of locate the virtual space inside of the physical experience and you know it plays out in a court case i think that's a kind of significant moment and it seemed like a story that would you know be interesting to try to tell now you 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 met the couple you interviewed them but it was your artistic choice to not put them on camera and and i was assuming that they were too shy or too embarrassed to be on camera but no that was that was well, your choice i mean i think that there, there were uh, like a lot of layers to the, the way that that ended up working out. And one of the things was that this isn't a film about them and like them working through what happened and, and, and they weren't those kind of characters really. And so the film is about like the system that created their story, the you know, telecom infrastructure, the way that games are designed and then the way that they're used. And so, um, you know, in the end, I think it. I think it was. It was very hard to to, to make a film with no characters, and you know, in, in that way, I feel like um, the kind of film that came out of it is very like weird and interesting. And you know, I like that the 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 main kind of character is this like animated child. You know, like it's. I think it kind of allows us to exist more in the brain space of the story. Because yeah. I, I think it, it's it's almost distracting, and they were you know like all these things you said, sort of shy, and it's a difficult thing to know how to talk about it. And I mean, John, this idea of online addiction is very real, and I think we all experience a little bit of it from the dopamine rush that we get when there's a new email, a new text, right. a new Facebook post, Twitter, um, Pinterest. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure we'll take a selfie together. Before uh, this absolutely, <laughs> as we well should, and then we'll be excited when we That's see right. a message from you of like, oh, he sent me the selfie. Um, um, so this is a, I mean, you know, there's part in the film, there's folks who are like, really, like they got off using online addiction, right. but it is a very real thing. That's right. Listen, this is, um, there are so many um, questions that this should raise. And I was really happy as I was sitting out here, because I've had a chance um, to think about this a long time since I met Valerie and got involved in the film. But to hear people's reactions at certain pieces that if you really understand what's going on with gaming itself, it, it, sh it shouldn't be shocking. Yeah. So 10 hours a day, okay? I, I'll give you a quick story, which is one of the main reasons this, uh, this project attracted me when I met Valerie, uh, outside of the fact that she's an extremely bright director and raising money to do these independent films is brutal. Um, I have two young daughters in you know, a similar age group, so I was attracted to this and my daughters were involved in this. But what really got me into this is my with me tonight, very well-adjusted, 29-year-old daughter who is working on her second master's degree wow. and works at the Metropolitan Museum, wait, is wait, 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 a, wait, wait. Yeah. two master's <laughs> yeah. degrees. Okay. She's a gamer, big gamer. Okay. And her answer to the 10 hours a day was, that's all. <laughs> um, and, and, and there's some great questions to, to look at in this. Um, my daughter met her boyfriend in a game. Oh, well. They were in an eight-year, very well-adjusted relationship. So, Just like they did. Right. And by the way, we're headed Thursday to Seattle to attend a tournament.
called the International, where first prize is $5 million. And $10 million is the prize money for this online game that's being played. And Key Arena in Seattle sold out in an hour for people coming to view the gaming. So a lot of this is, um, you know, what I like about this movie is things that are shocking new news to people. This is happening. Facebook just paid multiple billions of dollars to buy Oculus, which is a virtual reality headset that is, 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 is going. So the addiction piece is, is something to think about. But when we explored this together, this is question one and a shock variable of a huge topic. Absolutely. A gigantic topic that I hope this will get people to take a look at. I mean, the online piece is one part of this extraordinary, artful, beautiful film. Um, another part is just total parenting fail. You know, the sort of thing that we hear of from time to time for various reasons. And I'm curious, I mean, it, how many parents do we have here? Just raise your hand like fewer than I would have thought, but if, <laughs> if people just aren't raising their hands, say, I'm a parent. They don't want to get called. Uh, but I mean, like, how many people just hear the details of the story and they how could you as possibly have a little teeny baby and not be taking care of the baby constantly? I mean, I mean, you know, I'm a parent. I remember those first couple of months. We couldn't get away from my son, and not that we wanted to, but we couldn't get away with him for, from him for 30 seconds. You know, and you're like, I haven't showered in three months because I can't get away from the baby for one second. And you know, and the, and the woman's body is responding to just having had a baby, wanting to physically take care of the baby. And I, I'm like, how could she have not taken care of her baby? I think that the the animated child, the anima. Um, kind of had this like really nurturing uh, component to the way that that element of the game was designed and actually the double master's degree genius told me that a lot of Korean games around that time were building in these kind of pet devices in the games to increase female you know users in their game which I thought was interesting so I kind of look at it more like they were applying the parenting techniques they'd learned in raising this online child and and that sense of like I'll play for 10 hours and go home for 10 hours and it wasn't that they were abandoning the baby but rather like you know working to earn money and and just didn't have the you know community around them to be like you know hey it's a little different the feeding cycle There's or whatever instinct yeah. is it there isn't well is there I mean I think one of the folks in the film speak about it and I mean I mean you know there is there is an instinct to go to your child to save your child I mean so there was maybe like an overriding instinct that happened, right? I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think that the, you know, the way that the mind engages in things is very mysterious. And, you know, I, they really were unable to differentiate the emotional triggers of their online world and the instincts of parenthood. It's these, are, these are the great questions, right? A yeah. um, couple of pieces to it. They were great virtual parents. <laughs> they were. Right? <laughs> And they, and, and they didn't know the line between the two of them. And secondly, um, this question of addiction, um, you know, is it, is it built in? Are you born with this? Is it, is it the same as a precondition for addiction like we know it uh, on drugs or alcohol that we now believe is a disease? So is it a parenting issue? Or are these people, you know, it's raising tremendous amounts of questions. And certainly Korea, uh, which is another piece of this film that, that intrigued me. Um, their internet infrastructure was extremely advanced, government-based, so they had a fiber-based infrastructure that drove you know, tremendous capability. Um, that's worldwide now, and, and I think as the film also put out at the end, it's mobile now. Yeah, is that part of why, uh, the sort of environment, why this happened? Because Korea was advanced in terms of providing Wi-Fi for everyone, right, and the Korean gaming uh, industry was creating these games that these are too complex for you to have at home so you have to go out to these PC banks to in, in, to enjoy these games the American middle class would just buy bigger computers and consume them at home and then you'd never be able to get away from the crying baby um, and now that we're in the world of mobile then you couldn't get away from the crying baby because you wouldn't go to the PC bank so is that just is that sort of moment that historical moment part of why this happened 
I don't, that's a great question. I mean, I think the, the issue, of course, is would it make a difference if, in fact, now that we're moving towards 150 or 300 megabits per second wideband LTE and you can do even more on a mobile device, if you have a mobile device attached to a headset that puts you in a 3D virtual reality and you're sitting completely lost no matter where you are, is that any different than being in a PC bong, you know, at least believing that you're socializing with other people uh, at the same time? It just, as I said, this just raises a tremendous amount of questions, and, and I would just insert the other piece. See, what, we, what Valerie explored, and I think, uh, you know, we had some great discussions with HBO who, you know, kind of brought this film forward. One of the biggest problems Valerie had is there were so many topics that came out of this. And there's a beautiful topic about the entire gaming industry and as an occupation, uh, as an industry, as, a, as a, you know, a group of stars that were emerging and how parents responded when young 15-year-old Junior now had the opportunity to make more money than the family because he was, an, he was a, you know, a streaming video star in the games. Um, and then there's the second piece, which is this is not all negative. The gamification of education and defense yes. systems and you know, the, this has a completely other side to it. Yes. But one of the best parts about this is that's not going to get your attention. This will get your attention. Sure. And then it starts the dialogue. And that, that's the piece of this that, you know, is important. Help me understand um, why they got so little time. And was there outrage in uh, Korean society? They, uh, the father actually asked to serve one year. They initially weren't given any time, but he felt so bad he wanted to serve a year, but then wanted to come help his wife. You know, in, in, in Korea. I'm sorry, so, so did yeah. he actually serve the he year? He served the year, yeah. Okay. And um, in, in Korea, you know, the, the sort of dialogue around this story was a bit muted. And when we premiered in Korea a month ago, it was really exciting to. Uh, just experienced the feedback. I mean, like, they were like, you know, a bunch of 19-year-olds in the audience, and they really understood the film. They were like, how do we build a better world through technology? Like, they got the kind of the prompt of the story. And so, you know, I think that building a way to talk about this story is an important start to talking about it and the broader issues of this or whatever. But, you know, on a mainstream level, I don't, I don't think I, there was no, there's no like follow-up sort of outrage, you know. Part of what I think is so great about the film is you deal with this idea of these folks going into the fictional world, which blinds them from the real world. And I think sort of visually the way you deal with details and getting very close to certain things, um, and just there's sort of just sort of a dreamlike quality to a lot of the imagery and the transitions and sort of, you know, sort of mimics that sort of mental process that you're sort of talking about. Yeah, totally. I mean, that was something I really tried to do in the film is kind of recreate the landscape of the, the experience of playing these games. And, you know, I really love the animations that are in there uh, because, I, you know, I think that when we're in this virtual world or even when we're like on Facebook or in the back of our heads, we have this like, you know, social media sphere. We're always kind of between these two spaces. There is this other virtual, you know, reality that we all now kind of share. It's, you know, so kind of trying to like, you know, represent that was, you know, why it has that And feel. even just the connection between um, shamanism, right, and the ability to go to another place and then, you know, well, that is actually literally happening in these video games. Really interesting. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, could this happen in America? This, this story. It did. The in um, October of 2013, there was a Tulsa, the, Arizona couple who had a three-year-old who died of malnutrition, and it had like 20 home visits, and it just kind of the case slipped through the cracks. But the parents were Second Life DJs, and so they were yeah they were like always DJing in these nightclubs on Second Life, and. They're, the photo of them is like really, they're, you know, intense looking, and it was like an Arizona version of it. Oh. Yeah, in uh, there, the answer um, is not only has it, um, let's see, two, two or three, I don't know, a number of weeks ago I was down in Los Angeles at what's called the E3 convention. Yeah. It's the gaming convention. A uh, few months before that I was in Las Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show. One of them was a, 
was a, an old dying, and one of them was the most booming, money invested place to see. It, it was the gaming industry. Uh, unbelievable money going into this space. And so this, this issue is real. And, and young, you know, young millennials, you know, they like everything that's social. And these massive online games are a form of social. Uh, and the capabilities that are being brought down to allow them to immerse themselves in this are tremendous. And the, and the money, I mean, I will tell you, I, I started this film uh, you know, well before I went to T-Mobile. But I've learned a tremendous amount about this in many spaces. And um, I'm, I'm in the late stage negotiations to sponsor a team in the Dota tournament this Thursday and Friday, because that's, you know, that's the audience. I mean, and, and it's a big deal. So the positive and the negative, there's, there's a tremendous amount to, to look at. I'll give you one interesting question I, I noticed. Have you noticed, and you know, it's kind of dark, but there have been some horrific events in the United States where you know, uh, crimes have been committed. And then, interesting if you notice, uh, and you think back on this, when they describe the person who committed the crime, a number of times they say, we don't know much about him, he was a gamer. Mm -hmm. They spent, and it, it, it's, an, it's become, before it's even understood, it's an evil variable. Oh, yeah. Which is one of those things because people don't understand it. Mm -hmm. and, and I noticed that when I said, yeah, he spent most of his time playing games. That could be completely irrelevant, but it's on a list. Yeah. Uh, you oh. don't generally hear them refer to, and in, in, in her valedictorian speech, she noted the value that she got as a gamer. You know, so there's a there's a precondition, and it's because of some of these. No, things. you're right. There's a lot of times that's used as a negative. But big uh, money's going into this now. Too, oh, absolutely. So it's, uh, you know, I knew that we were um, in the hands of a thoughtful filmmaker from the beginning when we saw um, when they were talking to the the police detective, and you kept showing the the unmoving clock, right? That was making this this very audible ticking. But then I'm like, it's not it's not moving, right? So what did that detail mean for you? The, the time and and the our experience of time in the virtual space uh, is is are, are not the same, and that there's you know a sort of like temporal reality, and then there's this like other, you know, digital space that lacks a lot of those qualities, like, you know, time in the real way that it moves here versus time in the virtual space. Um, yeah. And then there's also like the dialogue is about how much time they spent on the internet, and I was just filming the clock, and I didn't realize till I had gotten back and was looking at it that it was stuck. I thought that was cool. Um. <laughs> so you guys didn't start this at HBO, right? You started this on... Well, I just finished uh, another film with, that HBO released, and um, they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, tomorrow. And I was like, going, <laughs> going to Korea. And because we'd um, kind of gotten our little group of uh, producers together, um, and so at that time, they were like, oh, this sounds interesting. We'll, you know get a first look on this. And so throughout the, the making of the film, I sent Sarah probably like 10 versions of the film, and she'd be like, I did not know what I just watched. <laughs> like, and so we, you know, it just was like this process. And then um, eventually, you know, when it kind of became clear, it was like, you know, Sundance was going to program it, and it was sort of time for the film to be done. They uh, really kind of stepped in to release it. So it's, it was very much a kind of conversation between Sarah and John. and all of the filmmaking team. I would have been much tougher on Sarah than, than Valerie was. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> this is, li listen, this is, I'll just give a perspective because I, you know, I came into this, um, you know, as a business person, part of this for me was, uh, you know, a, a living vicariously through artists' minds. They're a different breed of human being. You know, this is art and it's deep and, you know, and, you know, a young director like Valerie, whose first film did launch at Sundance, so she's a successful, trying to make her second film, scraping around for money, minimal money, very difficult. And the more I saw it, you know, and I was able to fund and bridge to HBO, who's, you know, wonderful in supporting these films. And this is a group of very young 20-something multicultural people creating, you know, creating this. And it was, it was great to watch and, and fun to see. And now, of course, that she's already had two, her first two films launch at Sundance, you know, we just assume HBO is going to buy everything she does and the price is going to go, you know, right up. Can we close that deal now? <laughs> How long does this one take you? Um, about a year and a half. I 
2012 in July is when I started shooting, and then, you know, we premiered it in January here. And so. you were in Korea for how long? For six weeks, and then we then the Seoul Film Commission uh, flew our t um, Alex Porter and Terence Connors, who's not here, um, out to Korea to film like extra interviews and B-roll. And this couple now is they're raising their child. Uh, they're, you know, it's um, her name is Autumn. The baby is the new baby, and um, and he drives a cab, and she's a stay-at-home mom. Wow, wow! I imagine you're going to have a lot of parents watch this and be I like. Know. I felt so bad. Our colorist, when we were getting it color corrected for Sundance, was like, you know. I walked in afterwards, and he was like, I just had a baby three weeks ago, and uh, like, I didn't know what this was about, and I'm really traumatized. I was like, I'm so sorry, man. I, didn't. I mean, It comes like a warning. This is a dark. No, I baby. know, because you have a baby, and it, even if you're like obsessed with the baby, you're constantly worried about, I'm going to screw you up physically, psychologically, whatever. Um, I mean, I remember we lived in fear of like, you know, the baby would fall off the bed, and then it would break its arm. Our baby fell off the bed three times. He's fine. They are much tougher than you realize. Um, but you know, they do have to eat. I mean, that number of 2.9 kilograms to 2.5 in three months was like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. But from there, where's the line? Uh, you know, as a parent and one who's learning tremendous amounts about this, I had a fascinating conversation with an unnamed head of a major conglomerate in Korea a few weeks ago. And we were talking about business, you know, on a global scale. And the meeting ended, and we had connected okay on business. But in small talk on the side, we, gaming came up, because we were talking about some devices for virtual reality. And he mentioned to me, oh, you have a, ch a daughter that plays games? Oh, he, and he said, my son is in boarding school, and he just got caught because they were stopping the use of the internet and him and his friends hacked the internet system because they play this one particular game. And they hacked the system so they could play. And, and this was a, a major guy whose son was brilliant. And he was you know, beside himself because his son was playing this game. And I actually gave him a hopeful story. You know, This wasn't the end of the world. But I also told him about this film. So it was a fascinating dialogue. And I, you know, and I think there's. You know, there is, back to you said, it's something to be aware of and to understand and to, you know, question, but then to understand the other sides of it and realize he's, there's a lot of problems. He's a good business partner. Yeah. He's always thinking about Love Child. Okay. Yeah, good. Nice plug. Go. Yeah. Um, so they, you talk about how Prius um, was shut down. Mm -hmm. Did they shut it down in response to the situation? People stopped playing because it, there was a stigma associated. I mean, I did. I, I learned when I went there, but these games go out of style in like a year. So it was sort of partially that this the fantasy motif was a bit out of style. You know, certain kinds of games are more in style now uh, that are a little bit less character driven and a little bit less story driven. I noticed, but but there's still a lot of the PC banks. Yes, and there's StarCraft and a lot of sports games and. Um, Lineage is a really popular game over there. Um, let's hear some questions from you guys. Anybody wants to get involved, raise your hand. Yes, you in the blue. You, yeah, you. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, Up there is a mic coming to you. If you want to get involved, just raise your hand. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a gamer. Uh, StarCraft is my drug of choice. And uh, obviously, the uh, the death of uh, this child was the was the big sort of uh, emotional tragedy. But maybe the more substantial and societal problem is is the uh, the idea of internet addiction. And uh, I don't know. There was an interesting point uh, in the movie where uh, you're the game developer is talking, and he's like, "It's my job to create an addicting product." Yeah. And uh, and and. Uh, you know, it's it's the government's job to you know raise GDP and and have uh, you know this this vast internet and you know telecom communication industries to you know have faster internet and uh, you know where does the buck stop? You know whose responsibility is it to take care of this society and and of this uh, you know problem of internet addiction? Is it is it a personal responsibility? Is it 
uh, cultural responsibility, you know, who, who's trying to, uh, who, sh who should be thinking about these problems, you know? It's an interesting question. What do you think, John? Oh, this is Valerie, so. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite line in the, in the film addressing this is one of the TV hosts in Korea says, government intervention doesn't actually solve anything. It, change is made through implicit social arrangements over a long period of time. So I think it's, you know, it's all of it. It's, it's learning to understand what we're doing, what are we using, what is this asking me to do, and why am I doing it? And, and then asking you know, the tech industry for, you know, bioharmonious technologies that you know can help us increase our sense of you know community connectedness empathy and growth and maintain the things that make us human like you know raising our young or other things like that so i think it's it's everything you mentioned and and, and part of i think the project of this film is to help bring that dialogue you know out to it's hard for me to imagine um a society like this in america um approaching this with anything but saying this is a personal responsibility issue um, when, you know, we let people who are of a certain age drink as much alcohol as they want, have as many guns and bullets as they want. Um, and those are things that we can clearly, demonstrably say, this can hurt you or others. Whereas the online addiction is not yet fully understood and is much more squishy, even though, as you pointed out, the sort of negative uh, connotations are already growing. Um, but unless we can clearly say this leads to X, you know, 50% of the time, um, it's going to be hard to, you know, to create some legislation or something beyond you, gamer, have to control, you know, what's best for you in this situation. I was at a meeting or a, a, a kind of conference a couple weeks ago about internet addiction, and the task of this group, or we were tasked with coming up with a list of bullet points that would be like circulated to the American Medical Association about like how much screen time is appropriate for a two-year-old, or you know, and, and and even that framework of how to dialogue around this, it's like, well, none or what is screen time? Is it active screen time? Is it passive screen time? Is you know what kind? It, all of this stuff is is you know, I think our our dialogue will get more sophisticated, you know, about this we eventually. Were, we were. I'm, I'm looking for more hands. We were uh, interviewing at some school in Brooklyn and. The, the interviewer says, uh, so I see that you work in television, and I'm like, yes, this is a good question. Give it to me. And you, how much screen time do you allow your child? Because we here at this school prefer zero. And I'm like, uh, we're not getting in this school. <laughs> and we didn't. Um, you, and then, and then you, and then you. More cut and dry. I think addiction is addiction, and neglect is neglect. And I wonder, in a way, um, was the government more lenient because of its tech infrastructure and its predisposition to this stuff? Like, if the child had died because its parents were in a bar drinking, would the penalty been larger? I don't know. Was it because of what he's saying, because the power of the gaming industry, or because they showed so much remorse and contrition? I think there was a lot at stake in the dialogue around this story, and I'm sure that you know ev everybody involved, even the gaming addiction clinicians, are highly engaged in the in interacting with this industry. So I think it's um, I think it I, I think it's not addiction. Maybe maybe if it was addiction, it would be different. But I think that it's a more complicated sort of set of behavioral factors that I don't know. That you know that word here. that word stuck in the middle of this dialogue changes so much. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, like we've just shifted from, you know, gaming being the cause of this neglect to the question of whether they have addiction, and then when you put it into the addiction bucket, is it a, is it a, you know, is it a preconceived issue? I, I think your point about big corporations, um, you know, all of a sudden we're saying do corporations have a responsibility, and when that that developer says my job is to get them addicted to it, I'm sure when he said that he didn't think of it in the concept of a negative addiction, but as opposed to a, a strong, overwhelming commercial desire to have his capability. Maybe that was the same case, you know, I don't know how many years ago it was when cigarettes were, you mm. know, a similar item, and certainly the question was, were they developed to create an addictive capability? Um, it's a fascinating dialogue. Well, you know, corporations are people, so. <laughs> um, you were next, and then <laughs> in the you in the back. <laughs> yeah, you in the black. my 
in mind was like the use of drones and how like the world is dealing with its challenges kind of through a similar avenue to gaming. And what, what do, you, do you think that's positive, negative? What do you think our future is with it? Wow. Um, I, won't, I won't put my daughter on the spot because amongst other things, she's very, very shy. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm watching. Um, I'm watching from both sides, as I say, a very positive side, and watching, you know, what gaming is and what it's driving, and, and you know, this highly intelligent, well-educated people that are using it to advance their knowledge and to socialize. I will tell you again, you know, as a parent, I was horrified when I first realized that my daughter had fallen in love with somebody for a long time that she met in a game. And so I did the normal thing that any parent would do. I hired a private investigator to check this guy out. <laughs> I, I mean, I put men on the ground with cameras to find this is out. It, it, does she already know this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is this, are I, we coming out to her right now, or? Yeah. It's not breaking news. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but my- And he's clean. Yeah, he's, he turned out to be a great kid. I mean, you know, I sent her back in to try to find another one in there for my other daughter. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to, to move from that, as you say, to things like, you know, drones, I think that's an entirely different, you know, that's the, then you're getting into robotics and artificial intelligence yeah. and, you know, a lot of things that if you watch the dialogue in the past few weeks, when people take those to the extreme in the short period without control, people get horrified and nervous because it's the unknown. And I think where we talk about just drones in particular, we have to differentiate. Are we talking about armed drones that are operating in Yemen and Afghanistan, et cetera? Are we talking about you know little robots that are taking things from Amazon fulfillment centers to your office and being like, you know, or just watching the border but don't have artillery? I mean, there's, you know, I, I think sort of somehow drone has come to equal armed killer drone as bill o'reilly would say but there's a whole large set of you know of unmanned uh aircraft that are working with our yeah you are getting into brilliant but separate conversations and we only have time for one more and i promised you in the back that you would have the next one. Sorry. Thank you. Um, it's the nature of these games that they eventually go offline. Um, and I'm curious about these addicts. They spent so many hundreds of hours building up a character, maybe even forming an emotional bond with a, with a digital character. Uh, you have any experience what happens to these addicts when the game goes offline and they don't have access to their you know, digital family anymore? Do they move on to another game very easily, or is it devastating to them as if you lost an actual family member? Interesting question. It probably depends on what kind of game you're playing. I mean, I would imagine World of Warcraft and those kind of games that have like a very long lifespan. Probably those elements of like deep social attachment exist with the specific game in the film. From what I understood, because I was looking for like Prius meetup groups or people who are like really hardcore into it, but really they're sort of trend based and you'll play with all your other friends where your friends are playing. So it's more about who you're playing with, not necessarily who your character is, at least in these like kind of multiplayer Korean games that we're, the film's about. Um, so we have a reception that everyone is invited to directly upstairs, so please join us and please uh, congratulate Valerie on an extraordinary film and John as well.